Welcome to the Invest with Clarity podcast, where you will learn how success in investing, as in life, is the result of absolute clarity. Mark Pearson of Nepsis in Minneapolis, Minnesota, shares his passion for portfolio management and commitment to transparency and communication to allow investors to fully understand what they own and why, bringing them to clarity in their investments. And now, here are your co-hosts, Matt Halloran and Mark Pearson. Hello and welcome to episode number 10 with Mark Pearson and Nepsis. This one is going to be a no-holes-barred, gloves-taken-off podcast because we are going to talk about the difference between traditional versus non-traditional investing. So get ready for some blood to splatter, everybody. We're not really sure where this is going to go. But, Mark, let's start breaking this down, man. Gloves are off. Let's. let's I love it. What, I love it. What is the difference between these two? First off, we uh, should probably set the stage, right? Well, let me right? tell you first off, uh, full disclosure, I, I don't mean to offend anybody in this. And uh, the comments I'm going to make are certainly opinion in nature. And so, uh, however, of course, I think my opinion is correct, man. Oh, but, sure, of course. full disclosure... I may actually get under the skin of a few people today. So I'm actually a nice guy despite what I may do today. So there's my full disclosure. (laughs) That was a great disclosure and a great setup for the fact that eyes are going to be opened. And uh, and again, you know, paradigm should be challenged here. Uh, Mark, that's I think that's one of the fun things about working with you and in interviewing you on these podcasts. And this whole idea of investing with clarity is because you are shining light on things that other people either aren't seeing or refuse to shine the light on. So let's shine the light. The, I'm going to ring the proverbial, you know, uh, boxing bell, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> let's let's talk about traditional versus uh, non-traditional investing. Okay, so here's here's my theory. My theory is that most financial advisors do not have time to manage money, and most financial advisors uh, came in the business to build relationships with clients and not necessarily manage money. Now, of course, there's always exceptions to the rule, right? But I believe most financial advisors came into the business to serve people, to lead people, advise people, as opposed to, quote unquote, be a money manager. Managing money is difficult to the extent that it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of resources. And there are a lot of moving parts when it comes to managing money. And when you look at, Matt, the vast amount of people that have investments and are uneducated about investing – and it's not because they're not smart enough. They just don't have the time. They hire the financial advisor to do a form, right? Financial advisors and individuals don't have all the time to do all the research to manage their money. So what do they do? They hire managers to manage their money. And when it comes to financial advisors, uh, most of them utilize what we call modern portfolio theory, right? You're uh, obviously you're familiar with modern portfolio theory, right? Absolutely. And this, th- this of course, is uh, what I believe an outdated theory to use, per se, in investing. Of course, modern portfolio theory is a theory on how risk-adverse investors can construct, construct, construct portfolios to optimize or maximize expected return based on a given level of market risk emphasizing that risk is an inherent part of higher reward. Now, first of all, I disagree with that statement. First, risk is relative. And many investors and financial advisors have been trained that volatility is risk, right? But as I've said to you many times before, volatility is opportunity when you know what you own and why you own it. Mm -hmm. Risk is how much you own in a given asset class relative to the rest of your portfolio. And if that if that asset class should go down, what is the risk associated for you, not only in the short term, in the long term? Because st- statistically, as you may know, Matt, bonds over time are actually considered statistically more risky than stocks. Now, most people don't understand that. Most people don't believe that. But to circle back to the traditional form of money management, Financial advisors end up using modern portfolio theory, which really is the idea of diversifying your portfolio and asset allocating your portfolio 
across multiple asset classes using what's called Morningstar style box. Large cap growth, large cap value, mid cap growth, value, so on and so on. International, real estate, blah, 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 right? And what ends up happening statistically is people end up getting over diversified, leading them to the ideology that I am invested, quote unquote, in the stock market, which of course is not the case. You're invested in businesses. You just own too many businesses that you're buying and selling through the stock market. Modern portfolio theory, Matt, I believe gives advisors and investors a quote unquote quick process to develop a portfolio to, of, of uh, assets that are asset allocated in a manner according to their risk tolerance. Now, why is that bad? Well, it's bad on multiple levels. First of all, most advisors and investors don't know what they own and why they own it. Number two, you own all these mutual funds and all these ETFs. You don't have the flexibility to take advantage of volatility, which many construed as risk, but actually is one of the greatest gifts given when it comes to investing. The problem is investors don't have the flexibility to take advantage of it, and they don't know what they own and why they own it. Number three, financial advisors are in the same boat. The financial advisor can't know what's owned in a mutual fund or an ETF until the 13 filings are filed at the SEC at the end of each quarter. So how does a financial advisor manage their clients and manage the money at the same time? It's virtually impossible. And so the way you do that is you create a process that makes it simple. And as time goes on, Matt, as ETFs become more prevalent and liquid, what you have now is a situation where you are putting more and more people, greater than ever before, into cookie-cutter portfolios. Cookie-cutter portfolios. And the problem is every investor's situation is different. How can you put everybody into the same type of asset allocation? That's traditional. Okay. How's that for a start? Yeah, I was feverishly taking notes there. Uh, all right, so let's talk about the non... Actually, you know what? Before we get to the non-traditional, I'm going to ask you a, a quick question. The cycle of investor emotions is a chart that if you just type in the cycle of investor emotions, it really does come up uh, and will show you when most people, the general public, buys and sells at the wrong time uh, with euphoria. What I'm hearing you say there is unless an advisor detaches themselves from the money management aspect of it, that they could be falling into the same traps using traditional money management or traditional foundational theory. Yeah. Is yeah. that a fair statement or am I way off uh, there? I would, I would say uh, – fair or unfair is not probably the right way I'd say it. I would say that it's, it's a little bit deeper than that. And what I mean by that is uh, we work with financial advisors all the time. Financial, there's nothing wrong with a financial advisor being involved in the asset management aspect and asset management conversation. Do I think that financial advisors who want to spend their day planning, do I think they should be doing trades – and setting up asset allocation strategies for their clients? No. They should be spending their time leading their clients, communicating with their clients about the plan. Remember in my Claritology uh, 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 podcast, I talked about that most importantly at the peak of success for an investor is that the investor must remember that their goals are paramount. At, at, at the bottom of the pyramid, really, volatility is an opportunity and investors should not view volatility as risk. They must view predictions and get rich quick schemes as probably uh, not only non realistic, but also risk. And I've often said that the greatest risk is not knowing what you own and why you own it, because we still got 15 trillion sitting on the sidelines. We're sitting near all time highs in U.S. indexes and many businesses that are doing well. The economy is doing well, and people still don't believe it, and they're sitting in cash. And they're worried. People get worried and nervous over short-term types of things. I think that's an outcome, Matt. I, again, just an opinion. I believe that is an outcome. That is an out, that's an that's a unintended consequence of a process that we have grown into over the years of putting investors into, quote-unquote, style boxes, cookie-cutter type of portfolios. Now, what's my proof? Well, there's multiple sources, but number one, how many portfolios have financial advisors looked at where people owned stocks in them for 10, 20, 30, 40 years? 
I mean, I had a call with a, an advisor this week. Guy's got a 1.5. He's coming into retirement. He's got a $1.5 million stock portfolio he's owned for years. His cost basis is 300000 bucks. And I'm going, that's what I'm talking about. That is phenomenal. Because at that point now, he says, well, how do I liquidate that down? How do I, how do I minimize his capital gains and reduce his exposure? True story, Matt. True story. How do I reduce his exposure? And I said, well, how much money does he need to take out of this each year? He says, well, he's not going to spend the money. <laughs> I said, well, hmm. well why, why would you sell the stocks then? He says, well, he's concerned about the stock market and volatility of the stock market and doesn't want to live through another uh, 2008. And I said, well, what does that matter if he's not going to touch the money? Have you talked to him about the idea that if he's not going to touch the money, when he passes away, he gets stepped up cost basis? $1.2 million is going to go to his family Tax freaking free. I mean, even if he goes down 40% in a financial crisis, 40% brings him to $1.1 million or $1 million, whatever it is, 800000 whatever it is. He's, he's still going to have five, dollars $600,000 of capital gains, and he has the ability to ride it out. And if he's got stuff at that point that's at a loss – Active management. This is where I believe active management is going to begin. You know, the whole active versus passive argument people talk about. Active management is going to become more prevalent once again because the cookie cutter traditional portfolio management style is going to move away and it's going to become more active again. And this guy says, yeah, those are really good points. I guess we need to bring him in and talk to him about that. Why would you just sell something to pay all that tax, Matt? I I don't don't know. You don't need the money. And all you're concerned about is the stock market? And then you can go to the client and go, okay, how long have you owned these stocks? Well, I've owned them for 30 years. Okay, so you've been through two financial crises. You've been through uh, 9-11. You've been through the Asian contagion. What possibly could you be worried about if it goes down 20, 30, 40%? You've got time to let it come back. He's only 67. Hmm. So I'm not going to manage money for somebody just to sell stuff and go do something unless there's an actual need for doing that. Sure. But that's a traditional form of money management. So you could go really deep on that one, Uncle Matt, in terms of how many roads you can go down. But the bottom line is the mentality of the financial advisor and the mentality of the investor is very cookie cutter, very black and white. I don't like volatility. I need to reduce my exposure. Hence, this is your transition to non-traditional asset management. Well, you just totally, you took my thunder there, man. Uh, so, <laughs> but you're, yeah, that's a perfect Sorry, transition. Peggy. It's no worries, no worries. So let's go there, go there. Let's, 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 uh, let's explore that. Yeah. So as you know, in traditional portfolio management, which is AKA cookie cutter in nature, it is the idea of asset allocation strategy. Asset allocation strategy is how much in stocks, how much in bonds, how much in cash. That is the simplest uh, breakdown, if you will, of asset allocation strategies in modern portfolio theory, right? How much do I put in stocks? How much do I put in bonds? And how much do I put in cash? I believe that the non-traditional format of money management, uh, well, let me back up first. First of all, I think it is completely ludicrous to own bonds at this point. And we have said it for five years. We're saying it now. If you look at five-year rate of returns of bonds, the returns are staggeringly bad, bad. In many cases over the last five years, uh, bonds are negative. They're down. And the danger here is that many investors, particularly older investors, live through a 35, 30 to 35 year secular bull market in bonds. And they were used to making money on bonds over time. That ain't going to happen now. And so traditionally, uh, the argument has been, Matt, that stocks are less risky than bonds over the long term. Of course, over shorter periods of time, in theory, bonds are less volatile, right? So people own bonds in their quote-unquote asset allocation strategy because, number one, they're short-term thinkers. Number two, they've been trained that volatility is bad. And number three, financial advisors believe the only way to do that is to reduce the volatility of the portfolio 
by having them own bonds. And traditionally, they would make money in the bonds anyways because you were in a, a decreasing interest rate environment, right? Those days are over. And when you look at the five-year return on bonds and when you look at the risk-adjusted return, the associated risk you are taking to own bonds relative to the return you're getting, it's horrible. Hmm. I tell investors the, th- the thing you need to focus on is if, you're, if you want to own bonds, it's nothing more than what we call the beta mitigator. It's designed to reduce volatility. You're not, it's a hedge. You're not going to make money on it. So I'm going to squirrel on you and tell you a story about a financial advisor from an from a investment firm who met one of my advisors and their client, sizable client, and tells the client, looks at the client's portfolio and says, this portfolio is way risky. They, she owns this, she owns that. This portfolio should be way more conservative. She's 69. It's a balanced portfolio. By the way, her five-year rate of return per year on average from 2013 to 2017 was just under 10% per year. Not bad for global asset allocation. As a matter of fact, it's freaking phenomenal. Yeah. And this guy says, well, she owns Baidu. She owns J. These are risky stocks. This is the kind of crap people tell investors. Risk is relative. First of all, how much of this stock do you own and how much does that impact the portfolio? And secondly, more importantly, the reason why asset allocation strategies are put in place in the first place, Matt, is to manage the short-term volatility that an investor can handle, balancing that with their long-term objectives. You can put together 100% portfolio in stocks and get a beta similar to a 60-40 equity bond split. So in other words, the volatility is similar, the risk is less. And this, and the advisor said to the client, to the advisor, uh, uh, the advisor uh, who has the client says to his son who's there, hey, uh, what are the markets doing this year? This is just last week. He says, I think the S&P is down one and a half percent. And how's the client's portfolio doing this balanced portfolio? He says, I think it's up about two or three percent. Huh. The other advisor couldn't say anything. So the volatility of this portfolio is lower than the market's volatility and it's outperforming even with what this guy construes as quote unquote risky stocks. Under, this, is, this is where you get to non-traditional investing. Financial advisors to differentiate themselves, Matt, in order to comply with the DOL, they are going to have to provide fiduciary uh, responsibility and value to justify what they're charging the client. There's no better way of doing that than having an active approach, a non-traditional approach that focuses on the overall s- true structure of that individual's client, that individual client's needs, and not some cookie cutter portfolio who this guy says she needs to be in a more conservative portfolio, which would say put 60% in stock, 40% in bonds. And my response to that would be that's far more risky than owning 100% in stocks. It just depends on what stocks you own. Hmm. So that There's is a, a lot huge. Of meat on that bone, yeah, there is a lot of meat on that bone. That's a huge paradigm shift. I mean, uh, asset allocation DFA, you know, Nobel Prize winning people have said the antithesis of what you just said there, which is you're going to be better off. But 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 things have changed fundamentally. Is that why modern portfolio theory isn't working and traditional investment ideas? What what am I missing here? Yeah. So, okay. So I think there's a lot of valid, uh, there's a lot of validity to modern portfolio theory, but modern portfolio theory is really the idea, you know, of asset allocation and diversification, right? Remember, it's the theory on how risk averse investors can construct portfolios to optimize or maximize expected return based on a given level of market risk, i.e. short-term volatility, right? Emphasizing that risk is an inherent part of higher reward. I don't necessarily agree with that. If I go put my bonds into my portfolio today, we're out of a 30-year secular bull market in bonds. Bonds 
uh, I think that bonds, which traditionally were designed to reduce volatility, are going to increase volatility and reduce returns. If, if you don't think I'm right, just look at what the 10-year Treasury has been doing in 2015, 16, 17, and 18 relative to what the stock market or individual stocks have been doing in the same t- at the same time. Where the reality is that people own bonds to reduce volatility and to gain income. Well, guess what? Dividend stocks can do the same thing. The difference between dividend stocks and bonds, of course, is that dividend stocks have inflation power. You know, as inflation goes up, they have they have they have pricing power. They can raise prices to keep up with inflation, keep up the dividend. When you're in a bond, you're stuck at that interest rate for the duration, right? So modern portfolio theory is, in my opinion, Matt, valid to the extent you should diversify and asset allocate across large cap, mid cap, small cap stocks. You should buy international. You should buy emerging markets. You should own real estate. You should own utilities. You should own cash, uh, depending upon your investment objectives and your tolerance for risk, your tolerance, i.e., for volatility. Interesting. I told you we were going to take the gloves off today. Yeah, we did. And uh, Can there... you shoot some... Please play devil's advocate on that for me, please. <laughs> well... It's hard because you make such a valid point there, right? I mean, it's hard because you're forcing me and our listeners to look at something that we have told, have been told is so bad, and you're really flipping it on its head, which is the overall idea of, of volatility. So I, yeah. I don't know. I think this yeah. is, they, I, yeah. I'll give you a great example. So in our concert, we have five models. We have income, income and growth, balanced growth and income and growth. And in our, it, it, for, it, it's, it doesn't happen as much now, but in 2015, 2016, for sure, 16, 17, in, it, you know, it, financial advisors would continually challenge me and the clients would challenge the financial advisor. And the statement they would make to the advisor is, why is Nepsis keeping so much money of my money in cash? Uh, why are we not buying bonds? Because this is the traditional mentality of the investor, right? And my response to the advisors and the clients has always been, will always be, look, you don't pay me to own cash. You pay me to know when to own cash. You don't pay me to own cash. You pay me to know when to own cash. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at the relative or cash instruments, Mm -hmm. you know, to, to manage the volatility of the client's portfolio. Clients have this idea, Matt, that they view volatility as risk. When you talk about risk to investors, their their idea of risk is the stock market going up and down. Okay, what we're really talking about at the end of the day when it comes to risk and asset allocation is what is the relative volatility of my portfolio to what most people would use, of course, is the S&P 500. So if I've got 30% of my money in cash or cash instruments or conservative uh, dividend or interest paying investments and the the beta, the volatility of my income portfolio is 0.2 to 0.3 relative to the S&P 500, am I not accomplishing the same goal, right, as if I'm owning 70% in stock and 30% in bonds? The difference is the returns have been far better in that method, in that method, because cash doesn't have a negative downside risk to it as bonds have had over the last three five years. And and that's the and that's why you kind of caught me a little bit dumbfounded with play devil's advocate because that to me is a huge huge philosophical shift. I mean, there are traditional asset allocators who are laying on the ground right now, holding their jaw because you just broke it because it's it's. <laughs> Forcing them to look at something, you're really, really challenging a major foundational belief in traditional money management. Thank and, you. And, and again, and I thank you for that. I love podcasting with you because every time we do this, you make me leave these podcasts and really seriously think about what I have been told. And I love that, right? I want somebody who can speak intelligently and with enough clarity to make me understand that there is a fundamental shift that you can make philosophically 
with how you look at money management. And Mark, I think you do a great job with that. Well, thank you. Well, just real quick, one quick, one quick add add on to that, and I appreciate your your thoughts and comments there. You know, this this gets to the core foundation of investing with clarity, right? Mm-hmm. The more you understand about what you own and why you own it, the more it can potentially enhance your ability to be successful as an investor and, of course, accomplish your investment goals and plans. And so the problem that many financial advisors have is they have product guys come in the door saying, hey, to reduce volatility, buy these managed futures contracts, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. buy these alternative investments. In fact, I can tell you unequivocally, as you remember, the 2005 to 2007 era where financial advisors were inundated with private placements, oh, yeah. particularly in real estate and mm-hmm. mezzanine loans. Mm-hmm. And the purpose of buying those investments was to reduce the client's overall portfolio volatility. Yep. Because people had just come out of 9-11 and the 2000 to 2002 40 plus percent drop in markets. And they were tired of volatility. And since... And hence, what do they do? They go and they all run and buy real estate. And they buy all these alternative investments to reduce volatility, only to see a lot of them go belly up and bankrupt through the financial crisis. Yep, absolutely. So it didn't do what it was supposed to do. Remember, flexibility and transparency are two of the four most important components to successful investing. You've got to have flexibility. You've got to have transparency. And you've got to understand what you own and why you own it. So you can actively manage through those difficult times to accomplish your long-term goals. This has been Episode 10 with Mark Pearson and Nepsis. Today we talked about the differences between traditional and non-traditional investing. And if you didn't have a yellow pad or a piece of paper to take notes, please go back and listen to this podcast again and bring these questions or even hand this podcast to a financial services professional in C. If they're as dumbfounded as Mark got me a couple of times on this podcast. So, Mark, thank you for your time today. Always good to be with you, Matt. Appreciate it. And uh, if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, like we always say, make sure you subscribe below so that you can share it with your family and friends. When you have an epiphany, much like I did today on the podcast, that way you can share those epiphanies with other people. For Mark and all of the people at Nepsis, this is Matt Haller, and we'll see you on the other side of the mic very soon. The content discussed is for informational purposes only. It is not a solicitation or recommendation for any securities that may be mentioned herein. Advisory services offered through Nepsis Inc., an SEC-registered investment advisor. 